was going to uh, share this morning with our congregation. So I read a, a wonderful article that was written uh, in 2010 uh, in the Washington Post. And it spoke of uh, an introduction that Steve Martin had given uh, at the 2010 uh, Mark Twain uh, Prize. And in that particular year, they were honoring Tina Fey at the Kennedy Center, and Steve Martin quipped, it would be easy for me to stand up here for the next few minutes and talk about Tina Fey's brilliance, her wit and her accomplishments in television and film, but that neither seems the right time or the place for that. Of course, he got a huge laugh because, as you obviously realize, that is exactly the time that you should be speaking a person's praise. But as the article unfolded, they realized that Steve Martin had used that same joke in 2002 uh, when he was introducing Paul Simon for a Kennedy Center Award, uh, which he said about Paul Simon, it would be easy for me to stand up here for the next few minutes and talk about Paul Simon's consummate skills as a songwriter and a musician, but this seems to be neither the time nor the place. And then he did it again previously in 2002 uh, for Carl Reiner. Um, and apparently, according to the... Washington Post, after doing quite a bit of digging, he realized, they realized that he had done it at the Grammys for Vince Gill. Um, he did it for the Television Hall of Fame introduction for Lorne Michaels. He did it again at the Kennedy Center Awards for Neil Simon. Apparently, according to the Washington Post article, Steve Martin had used that same joke 15 years running. Um, and uh, the funny part is, it was always a big hit with the audience. Uh, it reminds me, of course, of something that uh, a teacher of mine once said to me at the seminary, that a sermon, if it's good enough to give once, it's good enough to give more than once. Uh, it wasn't his suggestion that, of course, you should give the same sermon over and over again, that you shouldn't prepare anew for each congregation, each community, and each Shabbat uh, that you uh, officiate. But that your sermon should be good enough, uh, that uh, they're worthy of repetition. And so I immediately recognized that uh, it's true, that a joke is funny uh, once, it can be funny more than once, uh, and you've heard from me often tell you the same jokes over and over again. But it's the comment that Steve Martin was making that I find so uh, appropriate for this morning. I could stand here and tell you about the last line of Steve Martin's introduction, and that is, this is neither the time nor the place. And we immediately understand what that means and how many of us in our lives have heard someone say to us, this is neither the time nor the place, and how biting a rebuke that is, and how difficult it is to hear those words, because it requires of the individual who is hearing those words to stifle themselves for just a moment, to be quiet. And it sometimes is the way we respond to people by saying this is neither the time nor the place. And that is to suggest to them that you're not interested in hearing what they have to say. And that's exactly how that phrase is heard. Neither the time nor the place is often a rebuke. But what if it was meant with sincerity? What if it was meant with the utmost of respect? And that is to say, I want to have this conversation with you. And I want to be able to have it in the most non-defensive way possible. What would it look like if we had this conversation with no one else watching? If we could sincerely come together and find the right time and the right place to have our conversations, oh, how much deeper would those conversations be? The truth is, finding the right thing to say at the right time is one of the greatest challenges of ever having to say anything publicly. 
We know that people behave very differently when they are in private than they do when they are in public. This past week, (laughs) President Biden was heard on a hot mic calling a reporter something that wasn't very, very nice. I guess he was hoping that nobody would have heard it, but it was in front of a hot mic. It was something that President Biden had done previously when Obamacare was passed. And he turned to the president and he said this was a blank, blank, blank big deal. And while I might agree with both of his statements, they were neither the right time nor the right place to say those things. And that could be said of so many of the important lessons that we learn in life that some things are better either left unsaid entirely or to find the right place to say them. After all, I do believe there is a right place and a right time for almost anything to be said. And the impact that it can have at the right time in the right place is far more instructive than just speaking our minds whenever the thoughts come to them. When a person is down and out by a decision that they made in their life, it's neither the time nor the place to say to them, I told you so. Choosing the right time And the right place is incredibly hard. And sometimes the anticipation of having to hear those words has a far greater impact than actually saying those words in the first place. I remember my mother often saying, wait till your father comes home. Those words were enough to make us shake in our shoes. Well, in this week's Parsha, we have that exact lesson. You might recall when we read the extraordinary theophany of the revelation at Sinai and the instructions that came in that moment. There, in that experience, there is a strange, if not incomprehensible rule. Vayomer Adonai al-Moshe, raid ha'am, raid ha'ed ba'am pen hersu el Adonai l'rot v'nafami menu rav. God said to Moses, go down, warn the people that during this great moment of revelation that they not break through and rush up to see God's face because if they see God's face, they're going to die. Seeing God face to face is overwhelming. They warned the people, Pen yehersu el Adonai lerot v'nafal menu rav, warned the people not to break through to see God's face lest they die. To which I always wonder why. Why not make contact with the divine? How many of the mysteries of the universe could be solved with just contact with God? How much easier would faith be if we could come face to face with our creator? How different would our world be? How differently would people behave? How much suffering could we endure? How much good could come and could be done if we could only see God imminently. But this is neither the time nor the place for a sermon about deep theology and discourse and debate about the damage that's been done by people claiming to hear God speak to them. Do you see what I did there? Neither the time nor the place. All right. So this morning's parsha, Vayichtov Moshe et Kol Divrei Adonai v'Ashkem Baboker Vayiven Mizbeach Tachad Ahar Ushtei Mesrei Matzeva Lishnei Masar Shivtei Yisrael. Moses wrote down. We see in this morning's parsha, Moses wrote down all the commands that God had given him. And early in the morning, he set up an altar with twelve stones that were supposed to represent the 12 tribes of Israel. And he took this book of the covenant and he read it to the Jewish people. And they responded, everything that God has told you, we will do. You've heard that very famous phrase, we will quickly rush to do it. And then from that, we will learn what it's all about. You know, sometimes you got to do stuff before you understand why. And now the relevant pasuk from this morning's parsha, the relevant verse, it says, Ve'el et atzilei b'nei Yisrael lo shalach yado, 
Vayachazu et ha Elohim, Vayachu, Vayishtu. Yet God did not raise God's hands against the leaders of Israel. They saw God. Vayachazu et ha Elohim. They saw God. And they ate and they drank. And the Pasuk in the Torah says, but nothing happened to them. Just a few chapters earlier, just nine chapters earlier, it said, if you see God, you will die. And here in this moment, upon receiving the law in their hands, they recognized God. They saw God. And then they ate and they drank and nobody died. Even though the law is clear, and it will again be reiterated in a number of chapters from now that no one is supposed to get close to God. There is no punishment here. If you've ever been in a circumstance where people are always looking for exceptions to policies or you've ever heard a child say, but you let them do it, he can't help but wonder why this infraction, which was punishable by death, is overlooked here. You have to imagine somebody was watching and said to themselves, see, nothing happened. I guess we're all allowed to do it. I guess the policy is not for them. And so it must be for all of us possible. I can't help but hear the stiff-necked, belligerent, forever complaining people say, didn't you say that anyone who comes close to God's going to die? So why not them? To which the Orachayim, Chaim Ibn Attar of the 18th century says what Steve Martin said, this is neither the time nor the place. The Orachayim commenting on the words, Lo shalach yado, God did not lay a hand on these noble children of the people of Israel. He explains why God didn't do anything in this moment. God didn't want to spoil the prevailing spiritual high and joy of the people, says the Orachayim. The Orachayim says, is teaching us that this isn't the time or the place. That the Jewish people, upon receiving the law, were so elevated. They were so motivated. They were so overjoyed by this experience of receiving the law that God didn't take this moment to spoil that experience, to reprimand or to punish. Reminiscent of what many a college student who was caught with alcohol said, that would have been a buzzkill. For all of those who don't have a child or who is a teenager or older, that means you can really ruin a perfectly good moment by acting like a parent. That's what a buzzkill is. We live in a world that is filled with challenges to our spirit. There are plenty of people who want to bring us down and tell us what we're doing is wrong. Look, there is plenty that's wrong with our world that needs fixing. And there are plenty of people who are in dire need of a correction. But wouldn't it make more sense to pick our battles and to choose when to wage them. Not everything needs to be addressed in that exact moment. Maybe taking a breath might help us all to turn down the volume just a little bit and decide better on what requires our attention immediately and what can be postponed for a better time and a better place. But I guess it's all based on what we want to accomplish. If we want real change to occur in our world, then choosing the right place and the right time to focus on those challenges is just as important as the message we want to deliver. If we just, however, want to belittle, if we just want to degrade, if we just want to embarrass, then I guess we should all continue the mode of discourse that has become the very defining feature of our society has become the defining feature and the accepted norm of our society. And I think it's because people are not interested in real change. They're only interested in value shaming. 
In this week's parsha, through the timeless lens of the Orachayim, we're treated to a singular moment of restraint, something our society is in desperate need of. It's so much easier to blurt out what we're thinking and what we feel in the moment in which we feel it. But self-control would serve us so much more in Shakespeare's Henry IV, part one, when Prince Hal finds the cowardly Falstaff pretending to be dead on the battlefield, the prince assumes he has been killed. After the prince leaves the stage, Falstaff rationalizes the better part of valor is discretion, in which the better part I have saved my life. There are so many platforms for expression in our society today. But remember, discretion is a better part of valor. Shabbat Shalom. So we now have...